Yes, Enod. Today at the National Press Club, founder of Teach Us Consent, Chanel Contos. After the release of her first book, Consent Laid Bare, she'll discuss high rates of sexual violence in Australia, particularly among young people. Chanel Contos with today's National Press Club address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia for today's Westpac address happening on Ngunnawal country. I'm Jane Norman, a reporter with ABC News and a board director here at the club. Our guest today is Chanel Contos, founder of Teach Us Consent and chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership Youth Advisory Committee. Activist, change maker, author, Chanel it seems has almost single-handedly got the nation talking about uncomfortable issues of sexual consent and rape culture. She's helped make consent education mandatory in the Australian national curriculum and has just written her first book, Consent Laid Bare. You can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at Press Club Ost. Our hashtag is NPC. Please join me in welcoming Chanel Contos. Thank you for your warm introduction and welcome, Jane. It is an absolute honour to be with you at Australia's National Press Club. Thank you so much to the Press Club for having me speak here today and thank you to Ben Oakwis for organising this opportunity for me and so many others throughout my career. I would like to acknowledge that we meet today on Ngunnawal land and pay my respects to Elders past and present and to all First Nations people with us today or listening in. I would also like to acknowledge that Australia as we know it was born out of sexual violence. First Nations women were the first victims of this crime on this land by white settlers. The lasting ramifications of colonialism have made it so that First Nation women and children are still disproportionately impacted by sexual violence today. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence here today of people that have given their unwavering support to the movement to eradicate sexual violence. There's honestly too many to be able to name, but there are also so many young women that I particularly want to spotlight who I'm so privileged to also call my friends. Tess, Sienna, Leela, Holly, Zara, Billy, Claire, Hannah, Dee, Aliche, Sarah, Leisha, Alex, Lizzie, Emmeline, <laughs> and all the, other, all the other young women here today that are making the world a better place. I also want to point out that the reason that young women today can make the world a better place is because all of the older women who have come before us and paved the way. <laughs> that, didn't, that wasn't meant to be an insult. <laughs> I'd also like to acknowledge Senator Sarah Hanson Young, Senator Larissa Waters, and my local MP, Allegra Spender. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today, as well as the ACT members who have um, made it. Yvette Barry is somewhere, but I haven't caught you yet. When I was 15, my peers and I were taught what consent was for the first time. To this day, I found it the most singular, valuable lesson that I ever received at school. We were taught that this thing called consent was needed in order for a sexual act to not be one of assault. We were taught that oral sex and digital penetration without consent was also assault. We were told that intoxication made consent void. Because of this education, we had a collective realization as a year group that almost every one of us had either been or had a close friend who had been sexually assaulted. We clocked eyes as we sat on the floor of the school gymnasium and repainted stories that we all already knew about each other in a completely different light. That lunchtime, we were fueled with an overwhelming sense of validation for these experiences that we had collectively carried shame and guilt for. I will never forget that lunchtime because we sat there and yelled out how many years that we thought our rapists could get in jail based on how many years we had just been told by this consent educator. Five years, seven years, 10 years. Of course, we were in a state of blissful ignorance about how the legal system actually operates. None of us have ever had any interest in reporting these boys. They were our friends, they were our formal dates. For some of us, they were our boyfriends. We did, however, enjoy the fleeting moment of imagined justice under the false illusion of control. I see this exact moment happen almost every time I speak to young people. 
I see them give each other those same eyes. When I speak to girls and boys together, there's almost always tears because there's almost always a girl in that room having the realization that they had been raped by another boy in that room. When I posted on Instagram in 2021 asking, have you or has anyone close to you ever been sexually assaulted by someone who went to an all boys school in Sydney? In the 24 hours that that story was up, 203 people said yes, which was 73% of respondents. I then asked, if you went to an all boys school, do you think any of your friends have ever sexually assaulted someone? 64% say yes, which is 50, sorry, 64 say yes, which is 56% of respondents. I then asked people to submit testimonies of their own sexual assaults, naming the school they went to, the school the perpetrator went to, and their graduating years. I requested that people avoided using any identifying information, as I had no intention of singling out individuals. It was not simply about the fact that this had happened, it was about the fact that it happened to most of us. This turned out to be convenient as at the time I was oblivious to, de oblivious to defamation laws and how they are consistently weaponized against women who speak up about injustices against them. I launched teachersconsent.com as my Instagram inbox was unable to handle the amount of messages I was receiving. This website hosted a petition for holistic, age-appropriate consent education to be mandated in the Australian curriculum. It has now been signed by nearly 50,000 Australians and almost 7,000 people have posted their testimony of being sexually assaulted while of school age in Australia. I know the true number of testimonies to be much higher, but there was only so much that the group of people who volunteered to read and review the testimonies could handle. The process of avoiding defamation cases slowed us down. And whilst no one was explicitly named, people still identified themselves in these testimonies and threatened to take out cases against me unless I deleted them immediately. A year later, I presented at a meeting with all ministers of education from around the country, and they unanimously agreed to mandate consent education in the Australian National Curriculum from kindergarten every year until year 10. <laughs> a lot of people in this room are responsible for that as well. Before I discuss what we can do to change the fact that sexual assault has become a normal first sexual experience for many, I think it's important to understand first how this became the case. Let's begin by unpacking rape culture. Rape culture is a jarring phrase. It sounds like an oxymoron when almost everyone in Australia would agree that rape is unacceptable. But rape culture describes a cultural setting in which rape and sexual assault are pervasive and normalized due to society's expectations of and attitudes towards gender and sexuality. This idea of normalization is key. The reason that my consent education talk was so mind-blowing for me and my peers was because these behaviors that constitute indecent assault and sexual assault were so incredibly pervasive that we didn't even recognize them as an anomaly. A useful way to understand how this culture of rape is perpetrated, perpetrated is to understand what is known as the pyramid of rape culture. Imagine an actual pyramid or the shape of a triangle. Think about the bottom layer of this pyramid being made up of sexist attitudes, rape jokes, and victim blaming. This then props up the next layer of the pyramid that hosts acts such as image-based abuse, stalking, and coercion which then enables the explicit acts that sit at the point of the pyramid, like sexual assault, to occur. Letting behaviors at the bottom of the pyramid, like catcalling, locker room banter, and groping, go unchallenged, provides a solid foundation upon which more severe forms of sexual assault are normalized. I've heard so many times in my life that one in five women since the age of 15 have been sexually assaulted. The more I work in this space, the more I don't believe this. The statistic feels wrong, feels hollow and underwhelming compared to the reality. It doesn't account for all of these teens whose first sexual experience when they were 13 or 14 years old was void of consent. And it omits the atrocious number of Australians who have been forced to survive child sexual abuse. Further to this, many people will resist to classify what happened to them as sexual assault for various reasons. 
often because they don't understand what constitutes it themselves or because they don't want to confront the reality that someone they know and trust has done this to them. A 2021 survey of 14 to 18 year old Australian school students found that 41% of sexually active students have experienced unwanted sex. This statistic reaches 45% for young women, which is significantly higher than the still alarming statistic that 21% of young men have had unwanted sex. Unwanted sex is a lofty term. The survey simply posed the question, have you ever had sex when you didn't want to? The average age that students in 2021 said that they first had sex when they didn't want to was at the age of 14.9 years old. One in five of these young people said that they had their first experience of unwanted vaginal or anal sex when they were younger than 14 years old. Of unwanted, sorry. When asked what classified unwanted sex, 65% reported that they had experienced verbal pressure. 41% agreed to sex because they were worried about the negative outcomes of not having sex. 32% reported that they were physically forced to have vaginal or anal sex. And 28% reported that they were too drunk or high at the time to give consent. Moreover, 60% of young people who had experienced unwanted sex said that it occurred for the first time in the context of an intimate relationship. I heavily question how these definitions differ from sexual assault and echo the point that many girls and women do not want to identify their experiences with the word rape or sexual assault, especially when the perpetrator is someone close to them. This gives me every confidence to say that rather than the national statistic of one in five Australian women since the age of 15 have been sexually assaulted, we can actually say that 45% of young women sexually active before the age of 18 have been subjected to sexual assault or coercion. When we consider that just shy of 70% of Australian Year 12 students have had sex, this is a national health crisis. What I believe made teachers' consent distinct from other Me Too type movements is that it gave people the confidence to name this type of unwanted sex as an act of assault. Countless people from teenagers to grandmothers have told me that they didn't know what happened to them constituted as rape until they read other stories on teachersconsent.com. Often in conversations around this topic, whether in the home, in the media, or in parliament, we fail to acknowledge a vital piece of information. That is, who is committing these acts. We have the national plan to end violence against women and children, not a national plan to end male violence. Although 97% of perpetrators of sexual violence are men, and 50% of cases where a woman is involved, she co-offends with a man, which leads us to believe that male coercion is an important avenue for female offence. So let's take the time to think about the perpetrators of this crime. Forensic psychiatry research splits types of rapists into four categories. The first three are known as sadistic, angry, or compensatory rapists. They reflect our world stereotypes about how a rapist acts. If they end up in a courtroom, they're likely to be held accountable for their actions. I go into more detail about this in my book, Consent Laid Bare, but due to the short time I have with you here today to address this mammoth topic, I will focus on the fourth type of rapist, which is the most relevant and important to us. Entitled opportunists are rapists who have high social competence and commit their sexual assault on impulse. Their offenses are predatory acts that are unplanned and exhibit poor self-control. Little anger is exhibited and minimal physical violence, often none, which means it is often sexual coercion that is the avenue that leads them to sexually assaulting someone, namely pressuring, tricking, threatening, or forcing someone in a non-physical way, or using drugs and alcohol to make it so that the victim cannot consent. Their motivating factor does not come from a place of malice or sadism, but their belief in entitlement to immediate sexual gratification. These types of rapists are confident, powerful, and opportunistic in other aspects of their lives, which are all values that our society highly regards in men. Whilst the other three types of rapists may be ostracized due to, in society due to their poor social skills, this type of rapist can very well be perceived as a normal and nice person in all other aspects of life. 
they almost always perpetrate for the first time when they are teenagers, and they are often unaware of the fact that they have sexually assaulted someone until they are older and learn about consent, if they ever do. The reason they are unaware of this is usually because the people around them have often celebrated the sort of patterns that, exhibit, that they exhibit more often than challenge them, specifically that lower le level of the pyramid. Entitled opportunistic rapists make up the vast majority of convicted rapists. When we factor for the legal system being unequipped to prosecute these types of rapists, the number of reports that don't go further than the police station due to lack of evidence, the number of people who don't report to the police, and the number of people who don't even understand what happens to them counts as an act of sexual assault since they've never been educated on consent and uphold stereotypes about rapists themselves. Then we can imagine how much higher this true figure is. The good news about this type of rapist is that unlike the other three types of rapists where intergenerational trauma, abuse, and psychological problems need to be addressed in order to prevent them from offending or reoffending, an entitled opportunist can be prevented by education on consent and raising boys to be empathetic, particularly towards women. It is an extremely efficient allocation of resources to prevent this sort of violence, as we can channel minimal resources into the whole of community throughout their life, rather than large amounts of resources into an individual that shows risk at a young age. An entitled opportunist is unlikely to repeat offend if they have either been held accountable for their actions or if they've been taught explicitly what consent is, when it's required, how to ask for it, and most importantly, how to accept a no. Generally speaking, these types of rapists do not want to, act, want to actively hurt anyone. But that does not mean that they do not do that when their entitlement for instant sexual gratification outweighs their empathy for the person in front of them. I think stealthing is the perfect example of how easily sexual violence can be perpetrated by an entitled opportunist due to a lack of empathy and regard. Stealthing is the non-consensual removal of a condom during sex or the failure to put one on when having previously agreed to. Consenting to sex with a condom and consenting to sex without a condom are two drastically different things. Aside from the obvious risks of not using a condom, like increased risk of STI transmission or unwanted pregnancy, there are psychological effects as a result of having your bodily autonomy disregarded. This is especially true if you are left ill-equipped to describe what happened and why it made you feel the way that you do. The criminalization of stealthing is a natural progression after the achieving the objectives of the teacher's consent campaign, because it is an act of normalized violence that occurs at scale in a rape culture. What I mean by this is that it's a form of rape that is not understood by society as rape, and because of deeply ingrained male sexual entitlement, it occurs at an unknown scale without accountability. A report written by the Australian Institute by Sienna Parrott, who joins us today, and Dr. Brianna Chester from RMIT found that only 15% of Australians knew what stealthing was. Once the concept was explained to them, 81% of Australians believed that it should be criminalised in every jurisdiction. For a country that struggles to meet, reach consensus on most things, this is telling. It is incredible that laws in this country are being overtly declaring the sexual assault or rape. The ACT was the first jurisdiction to criminalise stealthing in October 2021, Tasmania, New South Wales, and Victoria followed suit. Thanks to the advocacy of Teachers' Consent and the Australia Institute, stealthing was explicitly criminalised in South Australia in November 2022, and just last month, this was implemented in Queensland. The Northern Ter Territory has also committed to this, therefore Western Australia is the only state left. Given the recent Senate inquiry put forth by Senator Nita Green regarding the harmonisation of sexual assault and consent laws around Australia, and the leadership of Federal Attorney General Mark Dreyfus in regards to criminalising stealthing, I feel confident that it is a matter of time before this occurs. A man who pleaded not guilty and was never convicted of charges concerning events that were alleged to have happened less than two kilometres from this very room has now been charged with two accounts of sexual assault in Queensland. I think it's important to note that these recent allegations involve conduct that amounts to stealthing. In other words, failing to put a condom on when agreeing to do so. Stealthing occurs often, but is seldom prosecuted. 
The point of changing the law is to set community standards, to reclassify the non-consensual removal of a condom during sex as wrong, to make it so that stealthing is no longer a form of normalised violence that goes perpetrated unconsciously and without accountability, but instead is understood by the common person as a crime. Language is one of the most powerful tools we have for shaping culture. Awareness around this deceitful act from the media, from conversations with friends, and from the law have the ability to counteract that socialised male entitlement that spurs too many to take that condom off or betray their sexual partner by never putting it on. Many victim survivors historically haven't had language to describe how they were assaulted or even how they reacted to being assaulted. This brings me to fawning. This is the next topic that is pivotal in understanding how we have created a culture where sexual violence occurs without accountability and a reason our legal system routinely fails victims of sexual violence. Recent improvements to our legal system, with affirmative consent laws being rolled out Australia-wide, thanks to the advocacy of Saxon Mullins and her team, mean that the freeze response is being accounted for and understood in the courtroom. However, legislation still fails to encompass other common reactions to sexual assault, such as the fawn response. Up until 1995, all research on survival responses, or better understood as fight or flight responses, were done primarily on males. At the turn of the millennia, researchers started suggesting that this primarily male-based research may have resulted in a unique female stress response being overlooked. Their, sus their suspicions were correct, and the concept of fawning emerged. Fawning is a strategy that we unconsciously learn to get ourselves out of trouble or a dangerous situation. It's acting overly nice in order to survive an ordeal. Fawning has received increasing attention from psychologists and psychiatrists as people tried to make sense of the incidence of sexual assaults and behaviors in the aftermath. For example, in the case against Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein, photos of his accusers smiling and flirting or working with him after the alleged assaults were used to position them as willing partners. Fawning can be understood as a response where the victim tries to get out of danger by taking on a persona that tries to please their perpetrator. In the context of an entitled opportunist, this could look like fake laughing, fake smiling, letting your rapist drop you home, pretending to lie there asleep next to them, or getting breakfast with them the next day, all things that are consistently weaponized against women as misunderstandings of consent. This trauma response is triggered when fight or flight are not options to achieve safety. It is common in women in heterosexual encounters of sexual assault because speaking in general terms, a man will be stronger and faster and trying to physically fight or outrun him is not a feasible or smart option. The tricky aspect of fawning is that even if the person triggering your survival response is not someone who would actually fight you back or who would actually chase you, your brain doesn't know that. All your body knows in that moment is that you are under threat and it must assume the worst case scenario to get you out of life, even if that means enduring sexual assault. This means that the cruel reality here is that fawning in a time of sexual assault can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Of course, we shouldn't ever send the false message that there is a right or wrong way to respond to being sexually assaulted. In fact, fawning is an extremely successful survival response. So if someone fawns and they are now safe, their body did the exact right thing. The point is that no one should ever be put in a position where they feel like their life is at risk or that they feel like they need to fawn in an intimate setting. And ultimately, this very human and very effective survival response must be understood by judges, lawyers and the general public to prevent it being weaponized against women when they seek justice. Finally, I would like to address a topic that I spent a long time avoiding, pornography. I avoided discussing this publicly when the campaign first kicked off, not because I didn't think it was important, but because I didn't want pornography to be scapegoated as the only issue and for people to not be willing to take accountability for this rape culture on themselves. As a feminist, I have many qualms of the porn industry in terms of its treatment of women and children and the persistent publishing of videos of rape and child sexual abuse. Again, I delve into this topic further in my book. But for now, as a consent education campaigner, my worries with pornography sit adjacent to this. Pornography is currently the main form of sex education for young people in Australia. 
60% of 11 to 13 year olds. <coughs> sorry. 60% of 11 to 13 year olds have seen pornography. And a 2016 study found that 53% of boys and 39% of girls believe that porn is a realistic depiction of sex. Learning how to have sex from watching pornography is like learning how to drive by watching Formula One. The world would be a very dangerous place for drivers if this was the case. And anecdotes I hear daily reflect the treacherous landscape for girls and women when pornography is used as sex education. It is difficult to truly understand the true societal effects of pornography, as researchers and scientists have failed to find a control group of men who have never watched it. A study found that women who watch porn were less likely to intervene when they saw other women being sexually assaulted. Pornography is known commonly to be used by sexual predators to groom their victims into normalizing violent acts. At what point does the mass consumption of pornography, particularly among youth, become a mass form of grooming that normalizes sexual violence? Whilst porn literacy must be incorporated in consent education from schools and from parents, I believe we must also have conversations about the ethics and health risks of consuming mass amounts of content that depicts violence against women and them almost always responding positively or passively. In December 2020, research on the damage of non-fatal strangulation uncovered that once a woman had been strangled, her chances of being subsequently murdered rose by eight times. At the same time this has been found to be true, choking has become increasingly prevalent in young men's sexual behavior, including in young men who do not have a violent bone in their body. How has it become so that a significant indication that a man is going to kill you has become commonplace in the bedroom? Now the context is set, let's look towards what we can do to change it. I do the work I do because I think the vast majority of sexual violence in Australia is preventable. I also have a strong belief that Australia has the potential to be a world leader in gender equality. It simply needs to be made a priority. It's incredible that consent education is now mandated in the Australian curriculum. I thank every person who posted their testimony on teachersconsent.com and who signed the petition for this to be a reality. It's promising that the Albanese government is investing $77 million in implementing this policy. And we have $5 million being given to the Australian Human Rights Commission to start surveying students on their experiences and understandings of consent, a project which I will be a special advisor for. And of course, I'm very thankful that Teachers Consent has been granted $3.5 million by Minister Rishworth to create social media resources targeted at 16 year olds and above and establish a youth advisory committee. It's important that youth led organisations are supported to promote healthy attitudes amongst peers. This is just the beginning though. In terms of education, we need consent and respectful relationships education to span more than just kindy to 10. Years 11 and 12 are important years for sexual development and the conversation must continue throughout them. We need more comprehensive porn literacy to counteract an indoctrinating force that's distorting the sexual landscape for young people. We need to use Australia's robust education system to implement changes at all points. For example, I believe the next important step will be for the government to use the initial teacher education curriculum to build the capabilities of the next generation of teachers to be transformative actors in respectful relationships. From a structural perspective, we must provide more options for reporting that sit alongside the current police system. When New South Wales Police and I launched Operation Vest, which let victim survivors know that they have alternative reporting options for sexual assault, Reports went up by an unprecedented month-on-month -month rate of 54% in the state of New South Wales. In my local area, where teachers' consent was extremely well known, it reached as high as 69%. This shows that if we provide people with options, people will use them. There is a national research team investigating an Australian-wide system. I heavily encourage this development and I hope we see it launching soon with appropriate funding. Research in this area and all areas addressing structural issues must recognise Australia as a diverse country and structural changes in this area must be made culturally appropriate to all. Reporting is one barrier, but accountability is the next. 
Conviction rates of sexual assault in Australia are 1.5%. This means that we have essentially decriminalised sexual assault in this country. If we are to hold true accountability for these actions, the actions of mainly children on other children, then we need to reassess our criminal system. It fails to bring justice. We need restorative justice options and mediation avenues that centre apology, empathy and the prevention of reoffence. And victims of their apathy reach some level of justice, whilst these entitled opportunists hold some level of accountability. The binary of no consequences or jail time is simply not good enough and doesn't reflect the nuance and real desires of many victim survivors. To remind you, when my friends and I were under the impression that if we reported our perpetrators, they would spend time in jail, not a single one of us wanted this outcome. Finally, we need to understand how all strides towards gender equality in different landscapes will reduce levels of sexual violence. I believe we need non-transferable parental leave for both parents to start addressing gender stereotypes and expectations at the source. I think this is the most important policy change that Australia can make at the moment to make strides towards gender equality. Ultimately, we need a whole of community approach with parents, educators, politicians, and members of the community committed to embedding empathy in our children and eliminating male sexual entitlement in a generation. With every policy that Australia implements, it should consult experts, youth, and people with lived experience. The intersection in these opinions and understandings is where we create the most valuable policy. I take pride in the fact that the work I do consistently bridges the gap between decision makers and young people in Australia. This year I joined the Global Institute for Women's Leadership to launch and chair their Global Youth Committee. Before this, I thought I was well aware of the incredible ways youth are showing leadership around Australia, but I've been absolutely blown away by the passion, the intelligence, the kindness, and the desires of people I have met in doing this work. We must commit to listening to them at every point in the process of change. Young people solve problems in unique ways, and a range of experiences can only add value to the success of our policies that our youth will be the ones to live out. To conclude, let's go back to the national rates of sexual violence. Let's humour the statistic one in five since the age of 15 have been sexually assaulted. So that's 20% of Australian women. In comparison, only 10% of Australian women smoke. So the current state of our country means that not enough men value the body autonomy of a woman to the point where it is more likely that a woman will be sexually assaulted than it is that she will smoke in Australia. This wasn't always the case, however. In the last 30 years, rates of smoking have more than halved. This is because of mass public education, policy and law changes, disincentives, and a value for quality of human life. Sexual assault occurs when the entitlement to another person's body outweighs their empathy towards that person. The issue at hand is an epidemic of male sexual entitlement. In an ideal world, we raise our next generation of boys to be inherently empathetic and respectful towards all others. In the meantime, and in reality, we need mass public education, policy and law changes, disincentives, and a value for quality of human life in order to counteract this entitlement. If parents yelled out the door, remember consent, as often as they were yelled out, don't smoke, when TJ just went off to a party, the world may be a very different place. The content I have spoken about today can unleash many emotions. One I feel often is anger due to injustice. I encourage you to channel these emotions into change, but whilst doing so, be conscious of who the anger is directed at. Given this, I would like to leave you with the quote that opens my book and guides all of the work that I do. Be ruthless with systems, be kind with people. Thank you for listening to me today. It's been a true privilege to speak here.
Um, thank you, Chanel. I always feel a bit overwhelmed by the power of your speech. Um, what you've managed to achieve in two years is, like, nothing short of phenomenal. Um, you're still, like, under the age of 25 when most people in this room won't achieve what you have in their lifetimes. Um, like, but history... <laughs> too harsh. Sorry. But, <laughs> but, like, history is littered with examples of women who try and force change, who stick their neck above the parapet only to be cut down. So it takes, like, an enormous amount of courage to try and force social change, try and change the culture. It's very uncomfortable for a lot of people to reckon with. I'm just curious about, like, how did you become an activist? Did you have a family history of advocacy or activism like who are the people around you who have been saying you know go get them continue on this really powerful journey so the people around me now and in the last few years who have been around me or well, before? all of it like in the last yeah. few years now who have sort of helped you continue well I mean right now everyone in this room not being cheesy but thank you there's seriously so many people here um, and also watching who have supported teachers' consent from day one. I think the fact that the testimony gained 50,000 signatures is testament to how many Australians supported this movement, and that is exactly why it was such a powerful um, story. I think that's why government responded. I think it's why it resonated with people. It wasn't about you know this one single incidence that people could say, not me, not us, not my problem. This was a structural issue that everyone had to face. And yeah, I mean, I think it's also really important to remember that when I posted that Instagram story, my intention was to get my old school and, like, the nearby boys' school to teach consent. <laughs> I was kind of like, I'll go and show it to the principals and, you know, there'll be names of the schools in here and it'll be really powerful and maybe they'll bring that consent education a few years earlier and it could change things for the young boys and the young girls. But the support of literally tens of thousands of Australians is what took it nationwide and made it so that change could happen. All right, well, our first question today is from Claudia Long from the ABC. Hi, Chanel. Claudia Long from the ABC. Thank you very much for your address today. Um, one thing that emerged during the Senate inquiry into consent that you were talking about a bit earlier is that while these issues are now, thankfully, thanks to your work in the curriculum, uh, public school kids are still really missing out because they're not resourced and their teachers aren't resourced to actually deliver that education, whether it's the time, the lesson planning, the actual delivery of those lessons. Given that this discussion, you know, has really focused a lot on the experiences of private school kids, um, how specifically would you like to see the government address that resourcing gap mm. to make sure that all kids get this, not just wealthy kids? Thank you, Claudia, for your question. I think what became very apparent when Teachers Consent started, as I said, my intention was to get my old school, nearby schools to teach consent. These were all private institutions. Um, what happened very quickly is it became very apparent that this was, of course, an Australia-wide issue. And, of course, um, public school sectors experience horrific rates of sexual violence as well. I think in terms of addressing this, what is promising is the $77 million that consent education implementation package that um, was one of the Albanese government's election campaign promises that we've now seen come through in the last budget. And there's an expert reference panel that's working towards how to allocate that money and how to best use it so that policy can be implemented. But I definitely agree with you. I think we definitely always need more funds going into education. Our teachers are overworked, under-trained, under-resourced, and whilst this is such an incredibly important topic to be learnt about in school. We can't leave it to just teachers to be the ones delivering it. We also need to ensure that everyone in the community is doing their part to reinforce the messaging that teachers are, um, teachers are doing at school. Just out of curiosity, would you back something, say, just off the top of my head, um, you know, sp specific, specific funding tied to delivering this sort of education specifically for public schools? Is that the kind of thing that you'd like this reference group to consider? I, so for context, I sit on this reference group as well, um, <laughs> and I would advocate that more funds go towards the state sector than the private sector, because I think that the funding into private schools in Australia is quite an interesting concept. Thank no, you. Maybe not for today. <laughs> Our next question is Julie Hare from the Australian Financial Review. Uh, Chanel, thank you very much for your speech, even though it was incredibly disturbing to sit there and listen to. Um, the Green Senator Larissa Waters said um, recently that universities should be places of learning, not rape factories. If you're a university vice-chancellor, I imagine that was a PR 
epic disaster that you didn't want, want to hear coming down the line. Universities have been dealing with sexual assault since 2016, but it's now captured the political zeitgeist. A number of Greens and independent senators are completely over this, and the government is forcing universities to, res to respond. Mm -hmm. Have you got any sense of why universities have failed to respond? Is it the entitled opportunists who reside in residential colleges? Is it just an unwillingness because this is a difficult topic to discuss? Is it because university vice chancellors are too far removed from their student bodies? I'd just like to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you so much. It is such a big question because um, universities are unfortunately rampant with these sort of cases and a lot of the time that is because these children who were just in school are now suddenly living out of home you know there's a large binge drinking culture one-upping culture a lot of um a lot of those residential colleges create almost like mini schools within themselves of the way they operate and i think it's hard because at school you have much more one-on-one -on -one connection with your teachers as the principal with students. Universities are very large institutions. There are a lot of students who often only come in just for their class and go home. There can often be the way the education system works in Australia. You can often not even contact your lecturer throughout the whole year. Um, so I think what needs to be addressed here is thinking about how universities can engage with students more often and understand that their student they they have a duty to ensure their students are safe on campus and beyond campus. But also this idea of entitled opportunists. Um, in my book I go into how wealth entitlement and male entitlement intersect to kind of heighten a lot of these issues. And universities are by definition elite institutions in certain ways. So I think the culture that often comes out of colleges in these certain spaces um, can be particularly detrimental to women and other people around them. The, so there is a working group looking at how universities can deal with this. Have you, have you got any ideas? Has, has your, have, have your insights been sought? I haven't been involved in that in any way. No, I very much look at um, the school system and how we can prevent. So the most common demographic of a rapist in Australia is a 15 to 19 year old male. So most of those years are actually in the school system and then those early university years. So I guess I'm focusing more on the school. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Krishani Janji from the ABC. Chanel, I want to look at dating apps and sexual assault reports on dating apps. So early this year, the federal government said Dating apps need to create a mandatory, sorry, a voluntary code of conduct, or they've been warned that by mid next year the government might intervene to make them more transparent, particularly when there are these huge issues that we've seen. Mm. You've previously partnered with Tinder on some of their projects. Can I ask how comfortable are you with their record on sexual assault, sexual assault reporting? Um, and Considering the many years that all dating apps have had to address these issues, do you think that waiting until mid next year for them to create a voluntary code of conduct is enough, or should there be intervention now? Thanks, Krishani. So, a few things there, just for context, the way I engage with um, Tinder and uh, also Hinge is through their parent company. So I consult on violence prevention and safety for them. and. I think that, I'm just going to split this question into two things. I think that things like government codes and safety features and reporting and transparency are incredibly important and I advocate for that heavily. I also think the type of sexual violence that that can prevent is often the types of people who are already have violent tendencies and are using these applications to actively weaponize and scale their harm on people. And I think they're really powerful for that form of violence. But I think what is missing from the conversation, which is the sort of kind of like partnerships I try to do um, with Tinder, for example, and public education, is people who are using the apps, behaving in a way that they behave day to day normally in real life, that is actually harmful and they're not aware of it. So. That's the real challenge there, because that's also where a lot of these sort of reports come from. So 
in terms of is early next year, is mid next year early enough? I mean, obviously, I think everything should be done right now, but in reality, this is looking at um, an industry working together with many different owners, stakeholders, different applications, and it will take time, I think, to have those conversations. Can I ask, though, just sort of extending from that, when it does come to uh, making sure that all of these apps are accountable, to mm -hmm. making sure that they do protect, protect sorry, victims of alleged sexual assault and violence, where we've, we've clearly seen issues in the past where, um, where perpetrators have blocked their mm -hmm. victims from even being able to see who they are or then being able to report them to the police. When it comes specifically to that aspect where there are instances of of violence, how much action should those apps be taking and taking now to make sure that victims can access justice? I think it should 100% be a priority. I think there should be collaborations with state police and giving more transparency to that reporting process. I know a lot of the dating apps have been working with the eSafety Commissioner and I'm looking forward to um, what comes out of this kind of industry code and if um, anything comes out of it saying it needs to be better. I also think that we need to ensure dating apps are actively willing to make all people better actors on apps, off apps. I mean, ultimately, the product that they're trying to sell is love, which means it is their personal responsibility as a private company to make everyone um, as equipped as they possibly can be to engage in healthy intimacy. And I think that, yeah, it should definitely, of course, be a priority. Shinok, can I ask you about the, um, well, the mandated consent education that's now been built into the curriculum? I'm just wondering um, two questions. Like, how is that actually being rolled out in classrooms? Do you know? I'm just curious to sort of visualise it. And, and secondly, was there any pushback that you faced from schools adding this into the curriculum? So how is it being implemented in schools? So it was brought into the curriculum as of this year, officially, which means that you know when teachers go and look at what they need to teach for the year, it's in there. Right now, it's up to the individual teacher to deliver this sort of education or kind of source their own resources. There are resources online like that the government um, has created, like, for example, Our Watch and The Line and things like that, where people can resources access these resources. Um, but this is what the implementation package is really about. It's about upskilling teachers, ensuring that they know how to deliver this content, they're doing it in a safe and trauma-informed way. So this is something that is going to kind of be a slow burn. Whilst the policy change is incredible, implementation is everything because it ultimately matters what an individual teacher says to their students on that one day. Um, and the second question was... Have you um, faced any pushback from schools? Yeah, interestingly, not much. Um, which, yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to say. Um, what's actually quite funny is when the curriculum did finally get through and I was speaking to um, a government advisor and he was saying congratulations and things, he said, the funniest thing is when this ended up happening, it wasn't even controversial. And that was testament to real cultural change. So I think that 2021 was a big year for this topic, for the topic of consent. I think an ongoing conversation and the fact that so many people around Australia were having these conversations at the dinner table in front of the TV, reading the morning newspaper, it meant that Australia was ready for it. And also it's pretty hard to dispute that we should stop young people from being sexually assaulted. So doesn't <laughs> firmly agree on that. Yeah. <laughs> Next question, I'm Tony Melville, a National Press Club director. Yeah, Tony Melville, director of National Press Club. Uh, you singled out all boys' schools there for one big area of concern. <laughs> Just wanted to tease out a bit more of your views on single sex schools like that. And with uh, all boys' schools, is it different messaging? We have curriculum, but mm. is, have they got the right tool, toolboxes, the, the all boys' schools? And I know in Canberra, we have Canberra Grammar that's now become you know, boys' and girls' grammar. Mm. Um, you know, is that, would you rather see that? Would you rather like to see the end of all boys' schools, for example? <laughs> See, my problem is that I don't particularly believe in single-sex education institutions for men, but I'm very pro-single-sex education institutions for girls, <laughs> which leaves us with a bit of a mathematical problem. Um, because, as I said earlier in my speech, I very often speak at co-ed schools where there's often violence within year groups. And I just couldn't think of anything worse than having to sit next to your perpetrator in math and like nothing being done about it. And I also went to an all-girls school and 
absolutely um, loved it and loved the experience of being around um, women and learning in that very safe space. So it's hard, but I think the thing with all boys schools is we have to kind of like take a step back and think about where all boys schools in Australia came from. So all boys schools in Australia were a colonial import. They came over with settlers. They were originally exclusive to women. They are traditionally very elite, very white institutions that uphold various amounts of power structures. I'm also, my master's dissertation was specifically on the power funnel between kind of elite single sex schools, particularly boys schools, and positions of power in countries. So we also have this loop where we have an overrepresentation um, of these schools in the way that our country is run and our policies and decisions. But I think that, I didn't get to touch on it in the speech and it might be too much for now, but um, I think the way that consent education needs to be delivered differently to boys and girls is not that they need to hear different content, but they need additional content depending on where they're at. So for example, I think that healthy masculinities conversation should underscore all conversations on consent and it's often very beneficial to have that conversation before having a conversation on consent. Um, I think that all boys schools can often create cultures within themselves, the same as the universities. Sports are often extremely celebrated, wealth is celebrated, and often girls become seen as conquests in these environments. So my concern is how can we counteract that and make all boys schools places where empathy and kindness and creativity and whatever an expression of manhood is, is valued just as much as being physically intimidating, being wealthy, and, um, and engaging in sex frequently. Thank you. Our next question is from Alex Sloan, a freelance journalist. Happy Canberra and living in the most progressive place in Australia. Thanks for the yes vote. <laughs> um, <laughs> just had to get that in. Um, Chanel, thank you for your talk today and thanks for your book and thanks for your incredible career so far. Thanks, These thanks. tender years, it's incredible. Um, you talked about that gap between jail and then no punishment. What kind of work are you feeding into in terms of law reform? So in terms of law reform at the moment, teacher's consent has pretty much exclusively been focused on this stealthing aspect. Um, and of course we have affirmative consent roles kind of coming around the country at different paces. But I think with that, look, con I'm not a lawyer. I don't think it's my place to think about a solution to this, but I do think it's my place to say someone needs to think about a solution to this. <laughs> and I think the I think there does need to be other options because, again, anecdotally, but I, I, it's probably not an exaggeration to say I've probably spoken to like more victim survivors of sexual assault than like most people. Anecdotally, a lot of people often want validation, apology, empathy, and respect of you as a human and that something went wrong, rather than the way the court system is now is the full absolute deny or think about having to go to jail just leaves no space for that sort of human connection. And again, the most common demographic of rapists in Australia is a 15 to 19 year old male. These are children. There is no place for children in the court system. They should not go in there. It's only going to make them come out better criminals. So I think we really do need to reimagine ways around this. I think restorative justice options. I think mediation. I think that Mandatory reporting in schools is obviously important, but it can be really problematic because often young people end up going through police interviews and all these things because they just confided in a teacher and wanted some support and were taking autonomy off them again. So I think there needs to be ways that in those safe spaces that children are familiar with, we can start restoring, rebuilding and working towards preventing re-offence. Yeah, I loved your line about young people solving problems in unique ways, but congratulations, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, you know, when you say you've spoken to perhaps more victim survivors than many others, but, um, you know, in the justice system too, I'm just wondering how you deal with the mental load of that, because these are people who are sharing probably some of the worst experiences they've ever had with you. Um, you're not a psychologist or a psychiatrist <laughs> by trade, so I'm wondering, yeah, how do you, how do you deal with the mental load of having people sharing really traumatic experiences with you constantly? Um, it's, I'm not going to lie, it's hard. It's obviously such a privilege to be that space for so many people, um, but it definitely does wear you down. And I really didn't realise, but I actually 
from reading those testimonies and teachers' consent, I experienced vicarious trauma. I didn't even know what that was at the time. It's when, even though something didn't happen to you, you feel as though it's happened to you. And that was a crazy process because, um, uh, yeah, I never even, I didn't even understand what it was. And I guess, unfortunately, now I've definitely had to put up certain walls and certain things. It's really interesting because I'm like such a crier. Like I cry so easily at everything. And if like there's a topic that's moving me or upsetting me, I will get quite emotive about it. But the way I engage in sexual assault is um, having to create that distance because unfortunately if I gave, and I'm sure everyone in this room who works in this industry can say the exact same thing. If we gave every single case the empathy it deserves, we would not be able to handle it. Mm. All right, our next question is from Hannah Ferguson from Cheek Media. Hi, Chanel. Hi, Hannah. I want to talk about the impact of the mainstream media on concealing or misreporting on violence against women, whether that be sexual or in a domestic and family setting. I think that, you know, we've seen five women in Australia killed by men known to them in the last 10 days, and especially Lily James, one of the biggest stories last week, and the way that much of the media report on that was horrendous. And we see either no headline about a woman who's died or been murdered by an intimate partner, or we see a perception where the man is uplifted and she, the blame is shifted to the victim of that crime. What do you think the role of the media is and the responsibility of the media should be in changing public attitudes towards this and should there be regulation in that communication and how it's done? Yes, short answer, yes. I think, really great question. I think the media should be so responsible for the way that these acts are reported on. I think the media is one of our largest tools for shaping culture and, you know, just the way that teachers should have training to have this, um, to be transformative actors in this change, so should the media. And I think we also need to stop with the clickbaity headlines that is, you know, basically trauma bait from someone's travesty. It's really interesting, I think, that um, this idea of justification is something that we see a lot. And two points I want to make here. Firstly, Lily James was, the murder of Lily James was something that I think really hit home for a lot of people. I think this was, one, because she was very young, two, because I, I live in Sydney, she, it happened in Sydney, three, it was a private school whose, you know, there's multiple testimonies about that school on my um, website showing this culture is epidemic there. But we also can't forget that Lily James was a white woman and this sort of media attention, the media very much elevates certain voices and certain experiences where how many women have been killed this year 56 or something so far and where is the coverage for that you know Matthew Matthew Perry from Friends died last week every single media outlet in Australia covered it why has not all 56 of those women's deaths been covered or those men who murdered those women why has that not been covered by the same amount of media outlets and given that same attention um, and then also on the way it's reported, so yes, again, in this context, um, there was things saying he was a school leader, he was a sports captain, elevating his status as if it's this kind of like shock horror, but I think that's the exact thing. We don't understand how someone who can also be a sports captain, who can also be a school leader, can do these sort of things, but the point is that anyone can and our society very much celebrates and embeds this culture in kind of all different aspects. Another case I want to bring up um, that was again also kind of close to home because I spoke there in the UK was um, a man murdered his wife and his child and she was the head of a um, private school in the UK and all of the headlines were like, man who lives in woman's shadow as if she had damaged his ego and that is why he responded in that way. Um, and a statistic that I want to point out to you is that if a man earns more than um, his female partner, she is 35% more likely to be subjected to domestic violence from him. So this idea of male ego is often a driver of violence and our media is consistently reinforcing that message and allowing that statistic to be true. So yes, I think there should be training and regulations and codes. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Our next question is Billy Fitzsimmons from The Daily Oz. Hello, Billy Fitzsimmons from The Daily Oz. Hi. Your last line to be ruthless with institutions but kind with people. I'm interested when it comes to responsibility. How do you balance structural responsibility with personal responsibility when it comes to rape culture? 
thank you. Yeah, it's really hard. I think that, in a sense, every single person should be taking it upon themselves to reflect on how they've contributed to a rape culture. Language we may have used, jokes we may have said. Um, and the thing is, this idea of ruthless with systems, kind with, pe kind with people, we can also be ruthless with our histories and kind to ourselves in terms of how we move out of those situations. So for example, at watching kind of like any movie that aired in the 2000s is riddled with problems, riddled with you know coercion and really problematic gender norms and expectations. And we grew up with that. So obviously that's the way that when we were 14 year old girls, we were acting and we thought we're cool and that sort of thing. So it's thinking about how did that happen? How can I do better? I think for people who may have been, you know, it may be closer to home or they may have been personally responsible for these sort of actions. I think it's really about being willing to sit in that discomfort and reflect and commit to doing better going forward. And I think that whilst individual people should of course still be held to account for actions that they did, whilst we have these conversations, I think it also onboards people a lot more in the process. If we can talk about these structures that affect us all, if we can kind of make the conversation open to be had without shame and individual blame, because when we blame, we scapegoat and we also turn people off. And it's no benefit to pretend that this is just a this problem or this is just a this one's problem. Again, with the recent um, murder of Lily James, I think that really hit home for me because I felt personally responsible in a way. She was someone who was around my age, grew up in my area, was working in my area. Why had we not done enough to make it so that that man never got to that position in his life? So I think that we need to, yeah, hold space for both, be willing to personally, in a safe space, take accountability, and then outwardly be able to have these conversations and challenge these overarching ideas. Can I ask you about your call in your speech for non-transferable paid parental leave? Can you elaborate a bit more on that, why you believe it's important? And have you had any discussions with Amanda Rishworth, Social Services Minister, or anybody in the government about this? We know that there is a package of PPL changes mm -hmm. on the way, but this specific call. I have definitely spoken about this with um, Tanya Plibersek. Um, and the reason I'm so passionate about it is because, so I studied in Sweden for eight months and it was like a joke when we lived there that you would see men with prams everywhere and it would be like, oh, there's a man with a pram and it would almost be like a game of spotto. <laughs> but that should be normal. And <laughs> as a group of Australians in Sweden, it's a shameful that that was not normal. And I think that in terms of, there's been extreme success out of it. There they have a much larger parental leave policy and it's use it or lose it. So if the male partner doesn't take a certain amount of days, then it, the extra leave is not unlocked. Um, and I think parental leave should be extended full stop. And then I think that we need to ensure that we get rid of those sorts of like discrimination and biases throughout the workforce and the expectations around what a man's role is and what a woman's role is in heterosexual relationships. Yeah. Good call. Uh, Claudia Long for her second question. Uh, hey, Chanel. It's Claudia from the ABC. Hey. <laughs> Again. Hey. <laughs> um, just following up a bit on Julie's question a bit earlier about universities. Um, you mentioned during your speech some of the work that you've done with one of the centres at ANU. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, ANU has repeatedly ranked as having some of the highest rates of sexual violence uh, at universities and in university settings in this country. Students on that campus, including those involved in, for instance, the STOP campaign, have said the uni isn't doing enough mm. uh, and they've accused them of potentially, you know, really not stepping up in this area. Now, obviously, you're a very busy woman. I don't think anybody expects you to fix every problem in this area <laughs> under the sun. But given how closely these issues overlap with your work, is this something that you have raised or will raise with university leaders? And do you think that there should be consequences, whether that's financial, like fines or funding restrictions, for institutions that don't improve these numbers on their mm. campuses? It's a very good question. It's a tough question because the reporting of numbers is a hard thing because often following conversations around this topic or removal of taboos around this topic, numbers can temporarily increase because, as I said in my speech, I, I think that we do have under-reporting and people underestimating these sorts of acts. So further education can actually result in higher numbers. I think that 
look, my personal involvement with universities, how I see that going in the next, you know, few, few months future, is this idea of the initial teacher education curriculum and the way that, so the same way there's a national curriculum for students, tell me just crumb. <laughs> the way there's a national curriculum for students, there's a uh, curriculum that teachers in Australia need to do in order to be qualified as teachers in Australia. And I believe student universities, if they want to prevent this culture, they should look at how they can use their powers and their systems to upskill those teachers, increase their capabilities, and benefit the kind of wider society. I'm not sure about specific universities and specific fines or things for that, but I think that as universities around Australia go forth with the recommendations from the Senate inquiry, it's really important that they're transparent in the way they do this. One of the recommendations was for a task force to be established to hold universities accountable, an independent one, fair agenda, um, end rape on campus. A lot of feminist groups have really backed that. Is that the sort of thing that you might support as well? Yeah, I would support that. All right, with that, we'll wrap. Chanel, um, thank you so much for your time today. Please accept our gift of membership to the club and um, please join me in thanking Chanel so much. For the stage.